Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston, this is episode number 138 and in this episode I'm joined by John Verveke. John is an associate professor in the teaching stream. He's been teaching at the University of Toronto since 1994. He currently teaches courses in the psychology department on thinking and reasoning with an emphasis on insight problem solving, cognitive development with an emphasis on the dynamical nature of development and higher cognitive processes with an emphasis on intelligent rationality, mindfulness and the psychology of wisdom. He is the director of the cognitive science program where he also teaches courses on the introduction to cognitive science and the cognitive science of consciousness wherein he emphasizes sizes 4e embodied embedded enacted and extended models of cognition and consciousness in addition he teaches a course in the buddhism psychology and mental health program on buddhism and cognitive science he's the director of consciousness and the wisdom studies laboratory john has won and been nominated for several teaching awards he's published articles on relevance realization general intelligence mindfulness flow metaphor and wisdom john is the author of the book zombies in western culture a 21st century crisis which integrates psychology and cognitive science to address the meaning crisis in western society And John is the author and presenter of the YouTube series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about exactly that, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this. You and I both, you and I both. So I've got to give a little uh, hat tip, first of all, to a a dear friend of mine, Tiernan Dixon, uh, because it was Tiernan that sent me the link to... Um, a wonderful playlist that I have uh, have had the pleasure of binging like a Netflix series over the last couple of months. Um, so I, I normally I normally have you on a screen in front of me when I'm sweating on my spin bike, John. So it makes a change to, uh, to, to not be. Thankfully, you couldn't see me doing that. I'm sweating away on my spin bike watching you as as I'm riding my my spin bike, doing a bit of exercise and. Uh, and, and, and I've, I've learned so much from you. So really looking forward to, to taking that and, and like I say, hat tip to Tin. And, and that was a particular um, YouTube playlist called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Yes. And um, I, I know it was a few years back that you recorded it and it's 50 episodes. I, I, don't, I think you stopped at 50 I, uh, from, from memory. And um, it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank and you. My, my my sort of explanation of it, because I've shared it with many, many people now, so I've sort of um, paid forward Tiernan's uh, gesture to, to me by sharing it with many, many people. Um, and, and the way I describe it to people is is you take us on a journey through the, the, the sort of the wisdom of the ages right through to sort of modern day understanding of psychology cognitive science and all some of the stuff that we're going to understand and, and the episodes are about an hour long it's 50 episodes so it's a, a decent length netflix series you know it might be five series if but the equivalent of five series of of, of 10 10 different uh, sorry five um series of 10 episode each if you like um yeah. and it's fantastic so thank you for that 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 incredible piece of uh of, of, of content that you've created but what i want to start with is what is awakening from the meaning crisis all about and why did you pull together that that um series in the first place so um, my proposal in the series the thing i argue for um and then i think what i try to respond to is that is this idea um that I'll do it kind of reverse for the series because the series I do the history and then the cog side, but I'll do <clears throat> this time. I'll start with the cog side and then go back into the history. It just seems to be right to me uh, at this moment. Yeah, um, yeah. So here's the idea. We can get into the cog side more detail, but um, you have a very central process that's necessary, indispensable to your cognitive agency. Um, and it's a, it's a way in which your brain is dynamically coupled to the environment. And uh, we can talk about that more specifically later. But the main idea is when you look in the cog side of sort of the core of your general intelligence, you find that the very processes 
The very same processes that make us adaptively intelligent make us vulnerable to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. There is, there is no sort of escaping from that. And so human beings have perennially faced a problem. You don't want to try and shut off that adaptive intelligence or you're doomed uh, because it's, it's the core of our adaptive uh, abilities. But you need to try and somehow ameliorate the self-deception. So this is a this is a tricky problem. How do you ameliorate the self-deception that's bound up with that fluid intelligence without, you know, hamstringing that fluid intelligence? And and, and because it, it occurs wherever you're using your intelligence, it pervades all of your life. So you need something comprehensive and that that deals with this really tricky problem. Now that adaptive intelligence, what it gives you is a way in which you're sort of fitted cognitively fitted to the world, connected. So let's gather it all together. You need something that's comprehensive over all of your cognition, ameliorates the self-deception, doesn't destroy the dynamic ad adaptivity, and enhances the connectiveness that it gives us. And that's a really powerful problem. And across history, and cultures, groups of people have figured out what I call ecologies of practices, we can talk about that later, sets of you know, interrelated practices for doing exactly that. And I propose to you that's what wisdom is. I propose to you that's what wisdom is. And so wisdom is not optional. It's indispensable. Now, those ecologies of practices around wisdom they, they can't just sort of hang free because we're human beings. They have to be situated. They have to be properly homed within culture because culture is how we shape the environment and shape ourselves to the environment, right? And so there has been a project across cultures, across history of creating a home, a community for these very different sets of things we do because they're not like the practices we do for hunting or you know or 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 planting or not all those because this is this is a this is one level above you use your intelligence to solve all those problems but you need wisdom to solve the meta problem of dealing with the self deception that arises when you're solve, trying to solve all your problems and so that has basically been religion that's re what religion has done it has created a community and home of right a home for these ecologies of practices for the indispensable cultivation of wisdom. Now, now we do the history. Th that homing of philosophy and religion has largely collapsed in the West, such that I regularly can ask my students this, where do you go for information? And they hold up their, sci uh, their, their smartphones like a good cyborg. Right. And I say, where do you go for knowledge? They're a little bit more questioning about that because of the time we're in and social media, but they'll generally say, well, I like science and the university. They should say the university because you're usually in my classroom. Right. <laughs> and then I ask them, where do you go for wisdom? Mm. And there's a deafening silence. And that silence is deadly because wisdom is not optional. And remember, wisdom isn't just more foolishness. It's also a reduction in that connectedness. And what we also know from psychology and cognitive science is that sense of connectedness, of being deeply homed and connected to yourself, your body, yourself, others, and the world, that, that, is, that is meaning in life. That is what people are trying to point to when they talk about how meaningful their lives are. So what we're getting here is a wisdom famine, starvation for meaning, and then it proliferates in all kinds of symptoms you see through the culture. And then, it, 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 and not only is it symptomatic of a lot of suffering, it's actually, I would put to you, also limiting our capacity to deal with the, you know, the, these very, these X risk problems that we're facing right now. Because here's the idea it's called scarcity mentality. When humans are, uh, find any one of their significant resources scarce, they get very short term in their thinking, they get very impulsive, they get very defensive, they get very reactive. Meaning is central to your cognitive agency. If meaning is scarce, your cognitive agency becomes short term, 
impulsive, reactive, prevents you from needing the expansive, reflective, committed cognition in order to deal with the X risk factors. And here's one more point, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> which is people will not give up their standard of living when they're in scarcity. Mm -hmm. But, but we know there's one thing that people will do. They will really take a hammer to their subjective well-being if they know it's going to be in the service of enhanced meaning. That's exactly mm. what happened when, pe when people have a child. Their subjective well-being goes down, their health goes down, their finances go down, right? They're not sleeping properly. They're not eating properly. Their relationship to their significant other is usually under terrific strain. And you say, why are you doing this crazy thing? And they say, because it's meaningful. I want to be, listen to the language. I want to be connected to something that has a reality and a value beyond my egocentric concerns. And of course, that's what a child is. So because we're starving for meaning, we lack the cognitive flexibility, and we won't make the sacrifice, the transformations we need to make in order to deal with the X risk factor. That's the meaning crisis, as briefly as I could put it. Well, that's that's definitely a summarized version from the 50 hours. So thank you for, for breaking that down. And there's, there's, a, there's a few things I want to pick up on that to, to kind of break it down, because I have for many, many years now sought out to learn as much as I can to do with human awareness, human potential, human behavior. And yes. there's, there's something that's been very evident in my observations of experiential understanding personally and witnessing it with clients and friends and colleagues and, and, and all my other observations in that when people are, they're, they're, like, as you said, sort of, I think you used the term sacrifice or, or strain that people are willing to take on, they're willing to do it for the greater good. Yes. You know, for, for yes. a greater good, they're willing to do, they're, they're willing to take on, let's call it short term pain for long term gain, either for themselves or for somebody else. Yes. If they're, they're willing to, to do those things um, and and have an impact in, in that way. But I, I, I want to dig into the, 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 the thing that you mentioned about that we and, and you used a very good example. If you ask somebody, right, if you want to get information, you go to their, their smartphone google is going to be probably google or youtube you know people are going to head to those resources other resources are available um that you can uh get get information from and then you say knowledge and then you use wisdom in in your um uh and, and then you you talk, talk about wisdom um and and i often think a lot of wisdom is is about um perspective you know and and seeing things for what they are and, and we're going to get on to it because i know you did a um uh, a ted talk many or tedx talk many years ago about neuro enlightenment and yeah. when you 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 take um someone like um uh D dr david hawkins for example and his map of consciousness and he talks about enlightenment and he talks about the meaning of life just is it's a one for one perception ratio it's not good it's not bad it just is and then we take wisdom and and, and wisdom is seeing things for as they are not as yes. we maybe we maybe we would like them to be which is where a lot of so source of um suffering comes from you know people want something to be something that it isn't but you you also talk about in the the, the place which is, is one of the I, I think one of the a, a fantastic distinction and i, I would like you to to um kind of share your version of it because i'm going to do a terrible job of explaining it but you, you spoke about the difference between causality and um correlation and you actually used quite an interesting well I, I refer to it as the pirates of the caribbean you it wasn't quite the pirates of the caribbean but you, you used you used an example of that which i, I think is quite important for people to understand the difference between um causation and correlation for yes. when it comes to wisdom as well if you don't mind uh, I, I don't mind at all um so thank you that's a, that's an excellent uh direction to take this in so let's talk about uh, an important capacity that many people see as belonging to wisdom which is intuition um there's related things i hope you also get a chance to talk about insight uh but intuition is you know, pe people have this sense of what they should do or what's needed, um, and they they have it just comes to them. And the uh, and part of the idea is that 
you know, one of the things we expect of a wise person is they have enhanced intuition. They really can sense what's going on and sense into the reality of the situation. Now, there's a very good proposal as to, uh, and putting sort of romantic and magical ideas about intuition aside, there's a very good, uh, you know, scientific, cognitive scientific proposal for what drives intuition. It's called implicit learning. Implicit learning is this well, I mean, really experimentally robust. We, the experiments have been replicated since the 60s. So the, this isn't going to go away, right? It's a, it's a real phenomena. Well-attested, well-evidenced you know, um, uh, ability of human beings to do the following. You can pick up on very complex patterns without deliberate effort or attention to them. In fact, if you try to direct deliberate attention and awareness, the, the, the complexity, the pattern you can hold shrinks. So it's this very, so for example, um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I sometimes use the example, how, how close do you stand to somebody at a funeral? Mm. I don't know, what, but you do, because you do it, right? And it depends on what part of the funeral it is, how distressed somebody is, how close they were, how close you are to them, right, but also proper decorum, but I bet you never went to funeral school, you never went to, here's how you stand, let's practice it, Timmy, how far do you stand, no, we don't, you, you've picked it up, <laughs> picked it up, it's a very complex pattern, but you know intuitively, is that, is that landing for you, Will, as, as, yeah, 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 for sure, okay, so here's the thing about intuition, it's based on that implicit learning, and here's the important thing about that implicit learning, that implicit learning picks up on any complex pattern in the environment. It doesn't distinguish, and then, I'll, and then I'll give the distinction, it doesn't distinguish causal patterns from correlational patterns. So to use, to use the example you alluded to, right? Um, there's lots of correlational patterns. One is that uh, Caribbean piracy has gone down as greenhouse gases have gone up. It's a reliable graph, you graph them, and you'll see Caribbean piracy going down, greenhouse gases going up. And so what you could propose is the way we'll deal with uh, climate warming is we'll bring back Caribbean piracy, because surely if we increase that, that will decrease uh, the greenhouse gases. And everybody realizes, oh, that's ridiculous. Here's another one. Large weddings are correlated with longer marriages. So you might think, ah, you know how I'll make my marriage last longer? I'll have a large wedding. Ah, but it's not the size of the wedding. It's that the size of the wedding itself correlates with how much family support you have, how much financial support you have, and those are causal of a long marriage. So I think I've given a clarity about the distinction. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we pick up on causal patterns, we're picking up on ways in which the world is really unfolding to your point. When we pick up, pick up on correlational patterns, we are not. We are picking up on something that's ultimately illusory. It is not putting us in touch with causal relationships in the environment. Implicit learning doesn't distinguish between these. So when we like it, we call it intuition. When we don't like it, we call it like bias, prejudice, racism, all kinds of weird correlational illusions that we pick up in an implicit fashion. Part of it, part of what we require to be wise is how do we properly educate implicit learning so that we get uh, we are more and more likely that to, to cultivate intuition that tracks the real causal patterns and doesn't get distracted and attached to the illusory correlational patterns fantastic well thank thank you for breaking that down and i know from a um from a um a, and you mentioned about um wisdom and the, the lack of wisdom um and and i want to bring this in specifically in a very current um situation with regards to the the, the um involvement of lack of wisdom and suffering mm -hmm. and people being in flow so if people are in feeling like they're in flow or they're, they're maybe not in okay. flow and they're feeling like they're suffering um, and, 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 and also want, want to throw in the mix here, cause I'm, I'm really interested in your opinion of the element of having 
the wisdom, as we've just described it, versus having the intelligence, like the intelligence of knowing something, but still being able to, to, to be, to be suffering. Is it to do with awareness? And you might, I, I personally might label awareness as an element of intelligence versus not having that awareness and, and, and being in suffering. Sure. So let me make sure I'm understanding you correctly. Well, you want me to talk first a bit about flow and then also the relationship uh, between aware awareness or metacognition. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And the distinction between intelligence and wisdom. Have I understood you correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose um, what, what I, yeah, I didn't do a very good way of explaining it, but in, in short, yes. And, but the, the link that I was, I was trying to make, and this is certainly my understanding of it, is that if there yeah. is a, a lack of wisdom, then it's an, an, a lack of intelligence, which leads to an element of suffering and the, almost the opposite of suffering in, in, in being in suffering is to not be in flow. That's kind of what yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I, can, I, I can draw I can uh, I can draw that thread out. Um, let's start at that. But I'll start with flow because it, it, it follows immediately from what we were talking about with implicit learning. Now, and note, note, the, note the point you made about awareness. Because this is a thing. This is why intuition strikes you as the way it does. You don't know where it comes from. You just get this not knowing, right? And that's because it's the result of implicit learning. Now, what you might think is, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll replace all implicit learning with just explicit awareness learning. You can't do that because you, right? The implicit learning functions primarily pro precisely by not putting demands on what's called working memory, which is your conscious awareness. So how does conscious awareness help us? Because again, you don't want to destroy implicit learning. You see how we keep coming across this pattern? Because mm -hmm. you absolutely need it, but you still need to ameliorate it. So what's the wise thing to do? Well, fortunately, we have the work of Hogarth talking about that. And Hogarth says, well, you know what you do? What's, what's, what's the best method we've come up with of distinguishing causation from correlation? It's, a, it's scientific experimentation. That's exactly what a scientific experiment is designed to do. So what you want to do, and it, right, what you can do explicitly with awareness is try to choose the situation or, and structure the environment in which you allow the implicit learning to occur. So you don't try to replace implicit learning with explicit learning. You'll destroy that, uh, that adaptive capacity. But what you can do with your awareness, is, yeah, but... What are the conditions under which I'm doing my implicit learning? You should make them as like a scientific experiment as possible. What are those? Well, in a scientific experiment, we make sure we, we, we don't have any confusion or vagueness or confounding of our variables. So we get really clear information. We structure this, the environment so the, the information we're getting is very clear. So clear information. Next, we, we, we make sure that what we do, we, we, when we manipulate the independent variable, will cause a very close right, change in the dependent variable. They're, they're very tightly coupled to each other. And third, error matters. It's possible that the experiment can show that our idea is false, that our mm -hmm. hypothesis is false. Okay, so clear information, tightly coupled, error matters. Okay, remember those three. And let's take a look at what Chick Mahai said. He said four things about what... So he talked about the environmental conditions of flow, but he talked about specifically what are the information processing conditions that are needed in order for people to get into flow. And these are the three. You need clear information. You need tightly coupled interaction and error matters. The three conditions that create flow are the three conditions that distinguish causation from correlation within experimentation. So Leo Ferraro and uh, uh, Arian Harrop, uh, 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 oh, what, uh, oh, what's her first name? I just lost it. Uh, Arian uh, uh, Bennett, Her Bennett, that's it, Arian Harrop Bennett. Uh, we published on this, we said, look, what flow is, it's an evolutionary marker that you're doing implicit learning under optimal environmental situations because you're doing implicit learning that is most likely to couple to causal patterns rather than correlational patterns. So think of somebody rock climbing. They need very clear information. If, if it's vague, they're in row, right? Um, their actions and how the environment responds tightly coupled 
error matters. You can fall. Mm -hmm. That's why it puts you into the flow state because you're picking up on real causal interaction patterns as opposed to illusory correlation. Because in, in um, so I've had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with or not familiar with um, Stephen Kotler uh, on, on, the, on the podcast. And one of the numbers that he talks about, which is quite interesting, because a lot of the time when people are in flow state, they're generally doing it, um, a lot of people talk about when they're doing some level of extreme sport, rock climbing, skiing, yes. the pace yes. and things like that. And he talks about the, you, the, the, the scientific data that he's got is that flow is created typically when you're up to 4% above your skill level. So the, the, by, by being 4% above your skill level, there's, there, there's a small margin for it. You know you're not going to die, but you, you're pushing that envelope. Yes. You're pushing the boundary, which is what you're talking about, the – the, the second element there of, of being able to, to have that variation that, that, that challenges you. Yeah. I mean, you, so you, we talked about something similar. We talked about flow is in situations of skill stretching, mm. right? And here, and here's how that links up with what I've just said. <clears throat> one of the way, <clears throat> sorry, one of the ways you improve your skills is by increasing your intuitive grasp of the environment your implicit learning of the environment while you're exercising your skill. So mm. that's how it's doing it. So there, the environment is putting the demand on you to do it. And then you're in the right situation for actually tutoring your implicit learning. So you get intuition that is picking up on real causal patterns rather than illusory patterns. Now, there's one other thing, and this goes to the weaving that you asked me to do. What's the condition the dispositional condition in, uh, of in people that is most conducive of them getting into the flow state mindfulness mm. mindfulness the training of awareness and we can talk a little bit more about mindfulness and how it's what in, in, instead of always automatically looking through your framing of the world and that's part of your adaptive intelligence what mindfulness does is allow you to step back and look at that framing and see how it might be causing you to misframe. Think about the rock climber. And I use rock climbing because the only reason why people rock climb is because of the flow state, because otherwise it's completely absurd behavior. It's completely absurd behavior. I'm hurting myself and I could fall and I'm tiring myself to get to the top of a rock and then I come back down, right? It, 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 it's, it's like a Greek mythological torture or something. But the reason they do it is because they get into the flow state. So the rock climber, right? Think about it. If they're misframing, and that includes their own body, right? The situation. If they're not finding the right things relevant, if they're missing seeing that part of the rock as a handhold, and they're not seeing that part of the rock as a foothold, it's there, it's in their awareness, but they're not framing it the right way, then they'll impasse. But what they can do is they can restructure what they find relevant in sailing. Oh, and so, oh right, that's a handhold. That's a foothold. That restructuring of what you find salient and relevant, that's insight. And here's another thing we propose in the book chapter, that what's going on in flow is an insight cascade. You have to restructure, you get an insight, and then that primes you. It makes it more likely that you can get another insight, which primes you for another insight. And that explains a lot of the features of flow. It explains why in flow, people find their environment super salient. It's like the aha moment and that flash of insight is being extended. It's why they have an ongoing sense of discovery. Why I'm discovering so much. Insight comes with it, a sense that you're, you're at one with the environment, that, that you're really connected to the way things are. So not only is flow tutoring your implicit learning, it's pumping like an insight cascade it's training your insight abilities and that's also independently valuable to you because you need that insight is a powerful ability to restructure your problem framing and overcome the ways in which you've deceived yourself by misframing and here's the connection one of the things that mindfulness does by making you aware of your framing is it improves your capacities for insight. If mindfulness increases insight and insight cascade is at the core of flow, 
This is why mindfulness increases your capacity to get into the flow state. It gives you that reframing capacity that drives the insight cascade. <clears throat> so in flow, <clears throat> you're improving your intuition and you're improving your insight. And more. And also another failing with implicit learning is it only picks up on whatever is given to it. But what insight does is it, it makes it explore new kinds of patterns. So think of a wise person as somebody who has enhanced insightful intuition into complex, messy situations. You can see why flowing could be so powerful and why mindfulness, the attention of your mental framing is so conducive to getting into the flow state. Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer, but no, 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 it's, it's, it's so interesting. And it, it kind of leads us on nicely to what I wanted to talk about because you, you use framing and I originally, one of the things that I trained in was neuro-linguistic programming and we talk about framing. And one of the things yeah. I very regularly say with clients is that you can't see the whole picture when you're in the frame, right? And as you yeah. use there, you, you for everybody that's listening to this and not watching this on YouTube, John John took his glasses off and, and sort of said about the framing, he's looking at the frame. So you, 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 you're you getting a different perspective in that instance. Yeah. Yes, yes, um, right. and, and and that that's what you're seeing. But you've also mentioned in the past about framing um, and, and using framing is, a, is, is an ability to learn how to learn as well. Yes, yes, very much, very much. So, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, think about the further analogy um, with my glasses. So, as you said, I'm wearing glasses right now. And my glasses are transparent to me because I'm looking through them. They're allowing me to focus on the environment in a way I can't when I don't have my glasses. So they're adaptive. The problem is my glasses also limit where I can look. Now, your cognition has to have mental framing. Here's why. The amount of information you can pay attention to in your environment is overwhelming. I could mm. be looking at my fan right now. I could be looking at the top shelf of my bookshelf. I could be looking at the color of my ceiling. Is that color over there the same? Think about, and, and just mathematically, the amount of information that you could explore is larger, like the number of, connections you can make is like larger than the number of atomic particles in, in the in the environment right same thing with how much you have in your long-term memory and all the ways you can connect it i can say aardvark in australia and you can wonder if there are aardvarks in australia right and so think about all the information all the ways you can connect it also overwhelmingly vast mm. here's all all the possibilities you could how many possibilities can you consider do you think how many can you come up with vast vast how about sequences of behavior my body is so articulated i could move my left finger and my right finger i could move them together i could move two fingers on each hand. think of oh my gosh all the sequences of behavior i could generate fast mm. and then, here's what you're doing will right now you're zeroing in on the relevant information it's obvious to you what you should be paying attention to which memories you should be consulting, how you should be putting them together, what possibilities you should be considering, and what actions you should be engaging in. And you're doing it right now. And that ability, we can't give to artificial intelligence because that is what makes you generally intelligent. It's what gives you your, your comprehensive, the kind of comprehensive intelligence that you have. So you could learn to swim, or you could learn Spanish, or you could learn how to do Tai Chi, or you could learn about Heidegger's philosophy. We can't make a machine that can do all of those things. Mm. Oh, it can beat you and go, but can you, but can it can swim better than you? No. Okay. That relevance realization, that ability to zero in on relevance realization, that's your mental framing. So in a word, well, sorry, in a phrase, what makes you intelligent, and this sounds like a Zen Cohen, and I, and I don't think that's a coincidence. What makes you intelligent is your ability to ignore so much information. Mm. But here's the price you pay, as you said about the framing. Sometimes the information you're ignoring is exactly the information you need to solve your problem. Yeah. I um I recently come so I'm I'm a big fan of uh, one one of my mentors and and, and someone I've spent a huge amount of time learning from um you may or may not have come across a guy called Dr John D Martini and he um he, fascinating guy um a, a modern day genius in my opinion I'd put him in the category of yourself in in that respect and um 
but one of the things that, that that I found fascinating, so he talks about the lower mind and the higher minds, so system one yeah. thinking, system two thinking. Yes, and yes, yes. What, what was really interesting when when the, that I'd never established before was you talk about intuition and he talks about when your intuition shuts off and when your intuition yes. is wrong, um, quote. And, um, it, and it can be, it can be, it, it's not reliable, which is when you have a ratio of seven to one thinking. So right. when, when you, you, you see positives and negatives in any given situation, and you have a seven to one ratio of positives to negatives or positives, uh, positives, to negatives or negatives, to positives, your intuition essentially shuts down and you can't rely on your intuition. So then how do you get out of that? Well, it's a process. He calls it the Demartini method of getting equipped, creating an equipped mind, um, and seeing things one for one. And, and, and it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating in that respect, but it absolutely aligns with everything you're saying about yes, being yes. able to see things as they are, not as they are. And, and if you take a um, memory, for example, we have an episodic memory and you've got the, 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 the memory and the anti-memory and our mind consciously or subconsciously at any given moment is choosing to focus on the memory or the anti-memory, which we've, we've stored all of it, but it's what we're, we're recalling in any given moment of time, which is, is, is is really fascinating um yes. when when you when you you break that down in fact um uh sort of cognitive science has moved beyond um just s1 and s2 system one and s2 people like stanovich and evans who were the original proposals it's it's something now more of a continuum um rather than sort of two distinct things uh so the difference uh, it's a different mode of operation so something becomes more S2, the more demands it put, puts on working memory. That's your conscious awareness, right? So the more it requires conscious awareness, the more you, you're doing S2. The less it requires conscious awareness, the more you're doing S1. So you actually now have a continuum because you can vary how much, you can see how much a particular task uh, puts demands on working memory. And so a good way of thinking about it, given what we've been saying earlier, is when there is a lower demand on working memory, you can rely much more on implicit learning. You can rely much more on intuition. And then when, and as you said, when intuition breaks down, it's because the task is now putting so much demand, requires so much working memory uh, that you then have to move into more S2 kinds of processing. And then you can ask yourself, and here's how it connects back to wisdom. What are the kinds of situations that put more demands on consciousness and working memory? Situations that are high in novelty, situations that are high in complexity, and situations that, at least initially for you, are very ill-defined. So very messy situations are the mm. ones that put that demand. And that's what, in fact, I propose to you, that's what consciousness is for. A lot of our relevance realization could go on unconsciously. You, you don't know how you're uh, searching through memory. It's going on unconsciously. <clears throat> but consciousness is how we right, have to do relevance realization, a kind of higher order recursive relevance realization on situations that are highly messy. They're complex, have high novelty, ha and they're very ill-defined. They're, they're, they're not very well framed for us. I put it to you that one of the reasons the training of consciousness is so associated with wisdom is because by training consciousness, we enhance our ability to zero in on the relevant information that's connected to reality. So relevant reality, we can zero in on the relevant reality in very messy, very messy situations, and we can mm. connect to it appropriately. That's a good definition of wisdom. A wise person can come into very messy situations and have that insight and intuition and see what's the relevant reality and frame it appropriately for intervening in it as powerfully as a human being can. That's wisdom. And I, I, I love that because I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now in the context, I'm, I'm putting actual contextual situations of when I've been able to, or someone with me has been able to hone in and go, yeah. This is what it is. They cut through the bullshit and make yes. you just see yes. see it for what it is. 
and sometimes that's a perspective that I had considered. Sometimes, often, it is a perspective that I haven't considered. Um, but I, I, but but when you so I, I kind of see it as zeroing in or um, yes, yes. Uh, of, of 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 focusing. But even then, when you talk about mindfulness, really a lot of that is is being able to have, have trained. I believe I'm running saying the the reticular activating system to to be able to hone in and hone and and not to to take out relevant information sorry take out the irrelevant information and, and focus on the relevant information which is essentially what we're saying right i think we're saying everything i don't think it's just the reticular activating system i think it's every i think the, the basal ganglia uh the frontal cortex the cortex cerebellar loop i do work on all of the uh the interhemispheric mm. insight is when uh processing shifts dramatically from the left hemisphere to the right and then back to the left there's all kind. I would I would say it, 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 it is the training you're talking about, but I think it's multidimensional in the in the brain. It, it's front, back, top, bottom, side to side. It's it it, it is wow. a, a sort of very dynamically complex self organizing kind of coordination that is being trained in wisdom. Amazing. So let, let's let's evolve that slightly um, sure. into because I, I I know that you're, as we heard in the intro, you're a lecturer um, of psychology and the cognitive science, but also Buddhist philosophy um, in, in terms of the-, oh, the that, Sorry, that, that's an old uh, that's an old thing. I'm actually an associate professor. I have tenure now. Uh, All right, that, okay. <laughs> just, to, just to be clear about that. So please go on. But the, but, but the, the other thing that I want to uh, uh, touch on, because a lot of this, when we're talking about consciousness and things like this, a lot of people will start associating that with a little bit more of a- um, uh, a spiritual element sure sure and properly understood, properly understood. yeah and yes. i i know that you've got um elements and 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 some some great examples and understandings of what you class as human spirituality yes yes so for people that think of spirituality at the moment and um i know i for many many years years ago used to think of spirituality in association to religion Yes. Whereas now I think there is a much more um, widely, more widely understood definition between the difference between spirituality in a religious context and then just spirituality in its own um, remit. How do you define okay. human spirituality? Okay, so first of all, well, this is an important point to tie back to the meaning crisis, because as you said, for a long time, the two were deeply interwoven. And what we have now is a, a, a project and it has, it has both benefits and perils, powers and perils of separating spirituality from religion. Another way of thinking about the meaning crisis is how do we help provide guidance, real education, real vetting, real community for people who are spiritual but not religious? Mm. That's another way of saying what the meaning crisis is about. So the fastest growing demographic are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who on surveys say they have no official religion. But they're not sort of, you know, hard bitten, by and large, they're not hard bitten sort of atheists. They almost always are spiritually seeking and they're spiritual, but not religious. Now, here's here's the problem with that. Oh, sorry, here's two potential problems for some people. They can it, that that works. But I want to point out the problems. And I am answering your question. I am answering your question because the problem you have for many people is because they turn away from religion, <clears throat> they pursue this spirituality autodidactically on their own. And that has two attendant dangers with it. Autodidactism can be a way of reinforcing your own subjective bias because there's nobody mm -hmm. giving you a perspective other than your own. There's no dialogue, it's all monologue. And so, and then, and related to that, and, and there's been some sociological and anthropological research on this, is spiritual but not religion can become narcissistic. It can become the religion of me. It mm. can become the religion of me. You know what's the most sacred thing? Me, right? And of course, that's ultimately false. And this is why narcissism is false. Because at the core, I, I put it to you, at the core of spirituality is that sense of connectedness, being connected mm. to yourself, to other people, and to reality. So spirituality is the reliable and systematic improvement of 
meaning in life. You're making your life more meaningful. So you're having more flow experiences. You're having, you're participating in those conversations that take on a life of their own. You have a sense of contributing and making a difference to something that has an existence and value other than your egocentric perspectives, like raising a child, like entering into a deep friendship, like caring for the environment, et cetera. And so the problem with spiritual but not religious is it can actually exacerbate the foolishness by, uh, by echo chambering your subjective bias. And it can actually, if it drives you into narcissism, thwart you from the connectedness that is actually central to sacredness, that meaning in life. You can see both of these coming together in an increasing phenomena, which we are now studying psychologically. And you've probably met these people. It's called spiritual bypassing. Uh, these are people who are all into spirituality and you can tell they're doing it because they're avoiding the real problems and the real responsibilities in their mm. life, right? So- like a, a, In like a, almost a form of disassociation, is that what you yes, mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we when I when I grew up and I grew up in uh, I, I won't get into my past, but um, uh, I grew up uh, in a Christian church, and we used to talk about people who were too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the danger. Now, please let me make sure I, I'm being being heard correctly. I'm not saying that everybody who identifies as spiritual but not religious is going down these wells, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm saying. These are very pregnant possibilities when you're spiritual but not religious. So what is needed for spirituality is the wise amelioration of foolishness and the wise enhancement of meaning in life. And to do that, and this now goes right into the cog side, you need, you do need ways of connecting to yourself properly. Let me give you an example of what I mean. <clears throat> so we have found a way to hijack the flow state. It's called video games. Video games mm -hmm. are the most powerful flow induction things that there are. They're more flow induction. They're, they're more reliably can get people in the flow state than extreme sport, than jazz, than poetry, the kinds of things that are prototypically because they're designed to do that because the flow state is such an optimal experience. It powerfully motivates people. So there are certain video games for certain groups of people that become addictive. The WHO now, re now recognizes this as a bona fide addiction. Here's the problem. They flow within the game in a way that, like, like spiritual bypassing, they flow within the game in a way that disconnects them and disassociates them from their life. So while they're flowing more in the game, they're dramatically flowing much less in their life. Mm -hmm. You have to wisely flow. You have to flow in circumstances that will translate. When I was a graduate student, I was doing, I started, I was about three or four years into doing Tai Chi Chuan very seriously, religiously, you might say. And I was getting all the phenomenological things like hot as lava or cold as ice and all that woo that's so wonderfully amazing. And then it all falls away at some point because you realize that's, that's, that's not Mark anything other than transition right but what happened is people were coming to me while i was in graduate school and they were saying what are you doing you're, di you're different you're more balanced in your approach you're more flexible in your perspective you're you, you're able to dance and flow with people and i realized oh my gosh the flow i was doing in tai chi chuan was transferring to my interpersonal interactions you need I'm just using this as an example. See, I need to wisely home my flow. I have to do it in the right way, in the right context, with the right framework around it so it will transfer into my life and not remain located in the place in which I'm flowing. I have been an avid fan of stoicism for many years yes. and one of the reasons why i'm such a big fan of stoicism is for exactly that reason in my opinion yes yes the, yes. the, the, the stoics they took let's call it wisdom but yes. it was it was used in the real world i think that there's a famous term isn't there like they're they're, they're in the arena of life or something that i'm sure a yes. famous stoic quote um but when you when you take stoic philosophy it was 
what I, well, you, you, I suppose now, as you call it ancient wisdom, back then it was probably modern wisdom, but um, it, 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 but it was used for the practicalities of life. It wasn't wisdom for the sake of wisdom that wasn't actually applicable to life. And you're, you're bang on because, you know, the Stoics described the optimal state of Stoicism as flowing with nature. That was how they explicitly described it. You, when If you practice Stoicism well, you got to a place where you were flowing with reality as a whole. So you're bang on about that. Well, you're bang on about that. And that's what I mean. And Stoicism, Stoicism is interesting because it's a, many people say it's right on the gray line between a philosophy and a religion. In fact, there's scholastic debate, I kid you not, about whether or not Stoicism should be considered a philosophy as a way of life or as a religion. And that's the point I'm trying to make, right? Where, so spiritual but not religious, if it's going to mean something, and if it's going to mean something that's going to guide us away from uh, autodidactic bias and narcissism, it has to mean the wise amelioration of foolishness. Stoicism did that in spades. And the wise enhancement of connectedness. Stoicism did that in spades. The flowing with nature. And it has mm. to be, it has to be, it has to be something that's a collective, a community. It was called the Stoa because there was a place in Rome. Was it in Rome or Athens? I think it's in Athens because Stoicism starts in Greece, where you, people would walk up and down a colonnade together, talking to each other. And, and, and by the way, this goes with a lot of research that we actually, we our capacity to improve, transcend our framing is enhanced, is at its best when we're in flowing dialogue with other people. So you give people a bunch of reasoning tasks, famous ones like, for example, the waste and selection task, individually, and I mean highly educated, highly in intelligent people, only 10% people get it right. You put them into groups of four where they can talk to each other. The success rate goes from 10% to 80% reliably, reliably. So you need to have, what Stoicism did was it taught people. Unfortunately, we have a truncated version because we only have the one side. It taught mm. people how to individually, but also how to collectively cultivate wisdom. And it provided a philosophical religious framework for doing that. We need to do that for people who are nuns. We need to do that for people who are suffering, right, depression and despair. We need to, and who, who and who cannot turn for various, I think, good reasons to the organized religions. That's another way of talking about the meaning crisis. That's exactly what we need to be doing right now. Amazing, amazing. Um, so, something else I wanted to to, to touch on, just because I always think it's interesting to um to to put people on a little bit of a spot. Knowing everything that you know to do with um, the two specific areas. Oh, no, I'm going to pick one for each, one for each. And knowing everything you know about psychology, cognitive science, and Buddhist philosophy, if there was one key lesson that you think is um, vital for the masses to know that's either a, um, a, a realignment of a misconception or just an absolute key piece of knowledge or wisdom, let's say, to do with each cognitive science, psychology and Buddhist philosophy, what, what would you say one is for each? Well, I can say what, one that, that, that actually they all converge on, which mm -hmm. I think is really powerful. There is no panacea practice. There's no one practice that will do it. Um, let's and I, I published on this. We talk about mindfulness in the West, but what we did is we took, here's the eightfold path of Buddhism mm -hmm. in which right meditation and, and right mindfulness are two separate things. By the way, saying that there's right mindfulness and right concentration meditation implies something like this. There's wrong mindfulness. Mm. There's wrong. And the right there is not moral right. It's like right-handedness. It's dexterity. It's the kind of stuff we've been talking about all through our conversation <clears throat> and but there's also right aspiration etc and it's an eightfold path that is represented by an eight spoked wheel because they're all interdependent you need this whole living system because each practice has its strengths and weaknesses 
And so you need to have complementary practices that counterbalance each other in a living manner. That's what I mean by an ecology of practices. Think of the way an ecology is all these organisms in all of these relationships and they're counterbalancing and constraining and, right, and, and affording each other. You need something like the Eightfold Path. If you, if you turn to Christianity, you see it's a complex ecology of practices. In fact, that's one way of understanding what religions did. Our problem is in leaving religion, which we have often left for very good reason. I'm not proselytizing here, but I'm also not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti-religious. But I'm saying in leaving that, we have tended to focus on, I'm gonna find the silver, I'm gonna find the silver bullet practice. The one thing that I can do, and it, the answer is, there is overwhelmingly good cognitive science. There's all this, I gave you an example from Buddhism, the eight spoked wheel. There's all the, 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 the stuff from the wisdom tradition, stoicism. Is stoicism a single practice? Of course not. It's a whole bunch of interlocking, counterbalancing practices. So you need this. If I was to put it in one word, you need an ecology of practices that you practice with people who will disagree with you at some points and nevertheless stay in relationship with you. And you need that organized and framed so it fits into a scientific worldview and doesn't spin off in crazy woo. That is my rec my primary recommendation. Wow. What, what, a, what a, like you say, a learning environment, you know, to be able to be in and, and uh, to, like you say, to have, have people that can challenge you. You know, I, I, be, I believe that optimum growth comes at the border of support and challenge. So you can have all your support. You, you, you can have all of your support in the, the your way of your thinking, but unless someone's ever challenging you, you're not growing. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's very well put. I like that. Um, the optimal balance between challenge and support. That's very well said. That puts you into Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, where you're most likely to actually grow, not just in the content of your knowledge, but in the functions that you have by which you try and know and understand. Love that. So talking about knowing and understanding, we're, we're in, as of the recording of this, it's 2022. Um, and technology plays a big role in our lives day to day. Like, you know, yes. we're, we're effectively cyborgs, you know, there's, there's not yeah, much yes, that we yeah. do with, without a bit, a bit of tech. Um, and um, in, in your TED talk, you, you spoke about um, psychotechnology. Yes. So how do you envisage the future of the development of human beings by combining technology and wisdom? Yeah, so... Um, I'm going to say uh, some things that initially sound bleak, and I want them to sound bleak because there's a real way in which that can unfold. Um, we are natural born cyborgs, to uh, quote uh, the, uh, the title of one of Andy Clark's excellent books. Almost everything that Andy Clark does is excellent. He's one of the world's premier uh, cognitive scientists. Uh, if you want a good introduction to cognitive science, start reading some Andy Clark. Um, but um, um, and, and we've been doing it for a very long time, and we forget what we even what we mean by technology. I just want to make this clear. We're thinking, oh, smartphone, cyborg. Um, you were a cyborg way before that. So, for example, you're wearing clothing. Clothing is not natural to you. Your biology does not produce it. It's a technology that allows you to move into different environments and to do social signaling in ways that you otherwise can't do. So think when you start realizing that the only thing that's not technology where you are is your naked body and the atmosphere you're in. And the mm -hmm. atmosphere has probably been processed by technology. You, we have been cyborgs for a very long time. So the chances that we're going to cyborg with emerging AI, especially AGI, I think it's inevitable. I think mm -hmm. it's inevitable. That's dark. That has, that has and, and I, I, I'll be the first to say it, that has a lot of really dark potential in it. Have you, are you familiar with Mo Gordat? No. So Mo um, was the chief um, business officer at Google X. So Google X was the the, the sort of exponential. They all, all the technology that he worked on had to impact a million, a billion lives or more. Fant fascinating human being. Oh wow! Um, he, he's wrote written three fantastic books. One's called Soul for Happy, but he's an engineer. Um, but he had a, a, a terrible. Um, 
incident, which I won't ruin for you because I think you're going to go away and research this guy. You'll find him fascinating. Um, he's a lovely guy. I've, I've, and um, But he's also written another book called um, Scary Smart. So bearing in mind, this guy was one of the leading authorities in Google um, yes. and then left the business. And he does a bit of whistleblowing on, on, on what's been going on with AI. And he shares his view on um what what the future is and basically how we can save the world but so for everyone listening to this i've actually interviewed him on my podcast on both his his self happy book and also scary smart i know scary smart was episode 100 um i can't remember what episode solve for happy is but um for anyone listening go back and listen to both those particularly scary smart based on what we're speaking about but um yeah it's um it's interesting. Sorry, I interrupted. You said, yeah, there's no, 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 uh, you know, having convergence conclusion from somebody as uh, powerfully placed as he was and is, I mean, it just enhances the plausibility of what we're talking about. So thank you for that. Um, Yeah, so we, 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 I mean, and we're getting already, um, um, you know, we're getting uh, transcranial direct current stimulating stimulation, Probably transcranial alternating stimulation is going to be refined. Uh, we have TMS, transmagnetic uh, stimulation, which we can temporarily shut off areas of the brain. And you should know that the the like the American military is already using both of these. It's using mm. TMS to shut people off so that they can temporarily turn them into psychopaths. Because when you're a psychopath, you get you lose all of the ways in which moral concerns are distracting you from the task. And you can get zero, you can get sort of this zeroing in clarity on how to kill people. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of immorality that can be massively associated with that. They're using transcranial direct current stimulation to get sharpshooters sharp shooters into the flow state so that they can learn faster how to be sharpshooters. Um, and you, I, you can imagine, of course, th- th- those are just two examples of multiple things that are happening. Um, I, and I imagine not only happening in uh, the military, which we have some information access to, but also corporations who mm. um, have all kinds of firewalls and security, they're doing things. Now, here's the proposal. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. We could get a, a, the best psychotechnologies. We could use cognitive science and looking at the existing wisdom traditions and religions <clears throat> to create the optimal ecology of practices and the optimal community. And then we could use that to most wisely use these new cyber technologies so that we could wisely use those technologies to primarily enhance our wisdom of how to use the technologies. And we could get a virtuous loop where we are cyborging in a way that we are increasing the wisdom for how we should cyborg. That is a Mm -hmm. real possibility. I call that neuroenlightenment. That is a real possibility, is a possibility we can start to, and people are in various places undertaking. For example, um, it has been shown experimentally, and I think at least a couple of experiments, that if you integrate transcranial direct current stimulation with mindfulness, you get improvement. Significant, you get a synergistic effect. You get sort of transformations greater than just the mindfulness or the, the transcranial direct current stimulation. Yeah. So so what what is the, the, um, the trans... Great. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. So this this so this sounds like this sounds like snake oil, mm-hmm. and I and I you know and I, I I'm glad that people uh, have that capacity uh, to reflect on it. But there's been literally hundreds of experiments around this. So you basically take a nine volt battery, you get the two electrodes, and you put them on various places, right? And what they do, and because they don't directly stimulate the brain so it's the mechanism is not quite understood um it may be some very complex combination of bio signaling and placebo but who cares because what happens is you get those areas you increase the probability of those areas of the brain's firing let me give you one example of this that i know the experiments about so you give a people a, a particular problem i won't describe the solution it's called the nine dot problem you probably saw it. yeah I've, i I'm, I've, i'm very familiar with it yeah Right. Now, the spontaneous solution rate, that means the rate at which people will solve that problem without you giving them any kind of clue or help, is statistically indistinguishable from zero. Now, what you do is you take a look at some of the neuroscience about insight, and in insight, there's a sudden shift of activation from the left to the right hemisphere. 
especially th these this area of the left hemisphere, the temporal parietal region, right? What you do is you give people TDCS, right? On this part of, you can just do this and put, put the ground here, for example, and you give them the nine dot problem. The spontaneous solution rate goes from zero to 40%. So just just to be just to be clear, then. So what you're saying next again, for the purposes of people listening to this, that aren't watching this on YouTube, you you are holding to um sort of to the bit between your kind of ear and temple on your right hand yep. side. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And what you're saying is that there's a form of electrical stimulus. Yeah. So this part of the the head. Yes. And that's what's creating some that that yeah. that jump and zero percent to forty percent. Increase in insight, yeah. The chances wow. of that happening by chance are, uh, Chai and Snyder calculated it at one in a billion. Wow. Uh, um, you know, it needs to be replicated, but uh, the fact that the US military is already using this to do, remember, flow is an insight cascade. If you can use TDCS to in, in, enhance insight, you could use it to enhance flow. I believe that's what they're doing, right? E et cetera, et cetera. But what if you did that what if you had an amazing ecology of practices like mindfulness, both meditative and contemplative, because they're not the same and they counterbalance each other, really enhancing people, that's, psych that's psychotech, really enhancing people's capacity for insight. And then you gave those people the TDCS and they got insight and, they're what, the, and that what they're doing is an insight in how to make the best use of integrating this cyborg technology into their ecology of practices. You'd have the possibility that we could get wiser about how to use this technology that could be used to make us wiser. And now we're a virtuous spiral. And so that's a real possibility. That's a real, that's a shining possibility because we typically what we do is we blunder into new technology and then try backwards, figure out how to use it wisely. We did that, for example, with atomic energy. Um, here, we actually have the capacity to integrate the emerging technology into the cultivation of wisdom so that we simultaneously get oh, the wisdom of how to properly use and direct the development of this technology. And we make its ability to enhance wisdom central to that project. That's a, that's a, for me, that's the light side of the force. That's, the, that's, the, that's a real possibility and it could really happen, but it's in a race with all the dark potentialities that are already at work. <clears throat> so I'm not, you know, what I'm saying is, can we educate enough people broadly enough that there is economic and political influence on how we do this? Because it's going to happen. The cyborging is going to happen. And, and if you're holding out hope, maybe X risks things will cause the collapse of civilization so that project dies. Maybe. Well, it, is that what you want? Uh, but if it doesn't, cyborging is going to happen. We can either just let it happen by turning a blind eye and pretending it's not coming, and then the dark potential wins, or we can maturely turn and face this reality and appropriate it in the direction that is neuroenlightenment. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Neuralink, for example. Elon Musk is he's, he's already el, el, using elements of that. Um, with with or I say of that, but utilizing um, technology directly with with human integration in a way that um, will will create uh, an, an impact. It'll be absolutely fascinating, John. I've absolutely loved this conversation. Thank you so much for for coming on and, and being a guest. It's been a great pleasure, Will. A really great pleasure. Uh, I, I, I we real I think we started to get into a shared flow state, which I think is optimal for these kinds of conversations. Absolutely. So if people have been listening to this and have had a glimpse into um, your, your your incredible mind, where can people go and find out more about you? Where can people connect with you? Where, where's the best place for them to learn more from you? I, I recommend going to my YouTube channel and I recommend them starting with the series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. They can also check a playlist called Voices with Herveki, where I do this with many people. Uh, I get into these kind of flowing dialogues. I call it dialogos with people who are very much uh, relevant and concerned with the meaning crisis, the cultivation of wisdom. And there's also another playlist that, called the Cognitive Science Show, where myself and one or two other cognitive scientists, we get into a, a, a dialogical process where, and we show the development 
of uh, a cognitive scientific theory. Uh, we did one on the nature of consciousness uh, called Untangling the World Knot, one on the nature of the self called the elusive eye, the nature and function of the self, one on uh, transformation called towards a metapsychology that's true to transformation. And I'm doing this with various people, always with Greg Enriquez, sometimes with Zach Stein, sometimes uh, with Christopher Pietro, et cetera. So if you really want to dig into the cog side, that's there. If you're interested in me academically, you can just go online, go on Google Scholar, plug my name in. I've got a lot of publications, recent publications, uh, especially around relevance realization, if you really want to dig into the science of that. So that's how you can find out more about me. Well, look, my, my, my uh, thing I can certainly vouch for is awakening from the meaning crisis. That That's definitely somewhere for people should start. We're going to put um, some links to what you've mentioned about in the show notes, but definitely go and head to the playlist on youtube watch awakening from the meaning crisis like i say i've i've been doing it for for for, for some time now sat there on my spin bike sweating over the uh over the, the the phone watching watching that i find it absolutely fascinating so uh john thank you again and thank you so much for your time um i've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and, and look forward to hopefully speaking again in the not too distant future uh if you uh, yeah i'd be happy to come back well this has been really a great pleasure thank you so very much my pleasure. And for everybody that's been listening, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. Make sure you join Will's free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. Please support the show by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give Will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, make it happen.